Welcome in everybody. It, oh, it's nice to like just see everybody pop up. Hi, Leora. We're happy to have you here too. Do you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide, Joanne? Gonna give it one more minute. And then in the interest of time, we're gonna go ahead and get started because we have so much content today to tease you for our series. Mm -hmm. Hi Beverly, where are you joining us from today? Ooh, I bet the weather is beautiful. Ooh, and Washington. We're gonna get all sides of the US today. All right, well, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, disclaimers and the who we are and how we got to hear so that we can jump into the good stuff. Hello, Betty. I'm in Phoenix, more Arizonans. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, Carrie. Uh, we are the National Training and Technical Assistance Center and we are funded by SAMHSA. This is your um, disclaimer that the session today uh, is funded by them. Go ahead and go next. So, NTAC overview. I'll start with myself since I am part of NTAC. Uh, my name is Yasmina and welcome to Building Bridges of Hope, uh, sponsored by the National Training and Technical Assistance Center, which is a multidisciplinary team of many subject matter experts. Um, here they are here. Click. And these are our presenters today. Um, if you three want to go ahead and do a little hello and a wave, we'll get to know them more later. We have Laura, Melissa, and Jane, and they are going to be sharing um, who they are and what brings them to this work and why we are having this session today. I already see that some of you have been um, putting your name and where you are, where you're calling in from, calling in from, it's like the radio, um, in the chat box. Uh, but also if you wanna enter one person that you're dedicating your learning to today so that we can get to know you, and why this topic matters. Hello, love. Today, I'm dedicating my learning to my sixth grade band teacher, Mrs. Weimar. And Jane is here for her daughter, Kathy. Rita here as a foster parent. Welcome, Rita. Leora is dedicating her learning to educators. 
who really, 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 really want to learn more about how to support students with high needs. Awesome, thank you, Leora. Hope is invested in learning today because she wants to ensure all the students in her service have access to equal and quality services. Betty uh, is here from v Voc Rehab. She's dedicating her learning to a former client named Travis, a young man that had most unfortunate circumstances. Love is a family support specialist from Virginia. She's dedicating her learning to her daughter. Melissa's here for her family today. Whoop, whoop. Julie from Maine is dedicating her learning to the teachers at Washburn School. Shalina from Omaha, Nebraska, I'm also a Nebraskan, is dedicating her learning to students who are unseen in classrooms because representation matters. Kylie from Oregon is dedicating her learning to all the kids that got left behind or get left behind. And Beverly is dedicating her learning to her mother and father. This is great. We have a lot of representation across the board. You wanna go ahead and click to the next slide? All right, I'm gonna pass it over to um, Laura, Melissa, and Jane so that they can introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about why we're here today. All right, you want me to go first? Yes. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm so glad you're here. Um, so as it says there, this work is extremely personal and it combines with the professional for me. Um, I come here as an educator, as a former administrator. I've worked in education at the nonprofit level. Um, I was a teacher in an alternative high school for many years. I was a student in an alternative high school for myself. So becoming a consultant working with schools on reframing towards a trauma-informed mindset became very naturally to me. Um, it spoke to a lot of my experiences, both as a student and as a, as a teacher. And I am spending a lot of time um, working with schools on things like regulation, right, and environment and, and mindset. And then personally, I am the mom of a kid who has a lot of big mental health needs and um, has been diagnosed with dysregulation, disruptive dysregulation mood disorder, and um, his eligibility is severe emotional disturbance, and he's on the autism spectrum, and you name it, he's been given all of the labels, right? So he becomes dysregulated um, almost instantaneously, has a very small window of tolerance ever since he was small, and is extremely sensitive and bright, um, and we've been navigating systems to support him since he entered into systems, <laughs> into schools, right? And, um, and, and at home before that. So spending all of, my, of our kind of personal family energy, figuring out how to keep him regulated um, has, taught, has informed my work with schools um, tremendously. And especially since he's been about 12 and he got very big um, and puberty and all of that, our lives have been um, a lot of chaos and crisis. And um, we've had a lot of good support from schools. We've had some not so good support. We've had, you know, good interactions with systems, not so good interactive interactions with systems. So um, I've learned a tremendous amount along the way um, of both the, you know, what it takes for inside a school on the school side as someone working in the schools and then as a parent, someone working with schools on that side of it to really support um, kids and families that have these um, kind of really big, big needs. So I'm really excited. I'm really, really excited to be here today and to share that with you all. Thank you, Laura. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself now? Yeah, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Marin. Um, I am a longtime educator in the Bay Area, I'm not a traditional teacher. I've been, I've worked everywhere between the preschool and middle school spectrum. I work a lot with uh, kids, particularly kids with, with, high emotional, high behavioral, high, high needs that just aren't flagged um, by most folks. Um, currently, I work for myself as a consultant and I consult with schools and organizations and families. Um, I help families kind of navigate um, 
some of the more challenging aspects of, of education and in, in, like institutions. Uh, I also come to this work as the parent of a, of a kid with a lot of uh, different, um, just a lot of different, different needs. Um, uh, and as a partner in a family where our, um, you know, our, our lives have been regularly impacted by the, the needs of our kid. Um, I come here as somebody who always wants to partner with the, with the other professionals who are involved in, uh, involved in our kids' lives and our kids' um, mental health and educational wellness. Um, as somebody who's frequently frustrated by the uh, boundaries that um, some of the bureaucratic systems uh, impose unnecessarily. Um, and also I come here with a really, mm, a really open heart and an open mind, um, excited to, to learn, to facilitate here, but to also to learn and to grow with you all. Um, and so I'm, I'm very, very excited to be here. I'm very, very excited that so many of you are here with us too. Um, and I'm gonna pass, pass it along to Jane. Hi everybody, I'm happy to be with you today. I too wear two hats. Um, I came into this work as a result of uh, one of our five children, second eldest daughter who's developed mental health and behavioral health needs as a very young child and has continued in the system. She has complex needs like the two other caregivers who've talked today. All of our children are unique, aren't they? And our daughter has um, developmental disability as well as uh, being hearing impaired. Um, those two disabilities, while well, not to understate them in any way, shape or form, um, have not been as great as the mental health and behavioral health needs that have uh, taken us on our journey to places we never thought we would be in emergency rooms and residential programs and everything else along the way. The other hat I wear is a social worker. And um, I am with the uh, Fredla, which is the family run executive director leadership association. We are a national organization of family run organizations, all of whom have children who have mental health needs. And we're very proud to be a partner with CARS in the National Technical Assistance and Training Center. And I'm happy to be with you today. I will mostly be manning the chat box and turning it over to the other two uh, extraordinary presenters. Thanks. So the reason that we began with that orientation to the work and that orientation to our facilitators is Throughout this series, the weight of the many hats and the weight of the personal and professional will often intersect. And we honor and acknowledge that we're all carrying um, many things when we approach this work. And so centering and orienting ourselves around that experience and around each other will be most important. So with that in mind, I'll pass it back to Melissa. Awesome, thank you. And I think we'll push ahead on the slides. And I, you know, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to take a moment to, to acknowledge where we are um, and, and what, just, just what this moment is. Um, I think that we're gonna push ahead to one more slide if we could. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, so here we are, most of us uh, in the continental US. Uh, we are living in many, 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 many extraordinarily challenging moments, right? Um, some of us just, just by virtue of being alive, some of us by virtue of being parents um, and educators, um, all of us by virtue of COVID and how COVID has disrupted our lives um, and how COVID has made targets of particular people in our communities. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, as, as many of you know, um, we're also living in a time when Black people are continuously being targeted uh, by law enforcement, and we've seen another horrific example of that this weekend. Um, all of this to say that this is all; these are all the things that are that are surrounding us, um, that buoy us, that sometimes push us, hold us down a little bit. And I just want to acknowledge as we enter into this uh, community of practice, this, this learning, 
this learning moment that we are all holding so much together. Um, within that, before we really begin, I wanna just ask us to sit for 60 seconds. And I'm not gonna lead you into any sort of guided meditation, um, but just to ground us for 60 seconds in, in our bodies and our time so that we can all sort of move together. And we'll start now. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sitting in that time. Sometimes that, that can be really long and other times it can be not enough. But I do want to just, I just wanted all of us to acknowledge time and be in time together. Uh, we're going to move ahead to the next slide, please. Wonderful. So I'm just going to go over the agenda um, for, for today. Um, so I guess, you know what, I'm just gonna go straight into it, right? No need for the flowery language. <laughs> Here we are, we're, we're, we are, today we're in the Institute where, where we're, we're basically setting us up for six weeks of community practice where we're gonna discuss um, the trauma-informed caregiver school partnerships in a time of COVID, um, in the recovery process of COVID and beyond. Um, we, so we'll be here for just, for just the next couple of hours. Um, our next communities of practice coming up, there will be six in total. Um, we're we're going to discuss such things as language, right? Um, like how 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 we how we move together as educators, as fa as family members. Um, and when I say educators, I want to be real clear about something. I'm talking about everybody from the person who picks up your kids and drops them off that's the bus driver to the person who's on, who's on the playground, to the person who's serving your kid food, to the paraprofessionals, to cl classified classroom teachers, to special ed teachers, to volunteers. I'm talking about everybody who has, an, who has a stake in your kid's education, right? In our children's education. Um, not just teachers, not just administrators, right? I wanna be, I wanna, I wanna make sure that we, that we, that we understand that our, our community is broad and it's much broader than just than just the narrow professionals, right? So we're gonna discuss in our first session, language, uh, why language is important, why it's important to be on the same page um, from obviously a people-centered, person-centered um, perspective. And we'll, we'll be moving on. We're gonna talk about building restorative classrooms. So, you know, definitely hitting on those, those aspects of restorative justice and how, how they do in fact dovetail with uh, positive behavior intervention, intervention strategies, um, how they are best practices, best trauma-informed practices, um, et cetera. Um, our next ones, we're gonna be talking about health partnerships in educational settings, right? And so not just not just the school nurse and the family, right? But, but since we will have already set up sort of like what, where, what language means and how it matters, we'll, we'll, be, ex we'll be exploring that, um, the very nexus of health in those partnerships in the educational setting as well. And then we're gonna move on to building relationships with caregivers. And this, this part, I think, um, will be as important as all the rest and um, really, we're hoping with all of you, we can really expand what it means, what it looks like to, to, to really build partnerships that aren't so rote, that aren't so like, okay, teacher and then, and then parent or teacher and auntie or whomever, right? Um, again, in, that, in, that, in this goal to build together, right? Laura, Jane and I will be here 
to facilitate, right, and to guide and move us through. But we're really, we're really hoping to help cultivate a community here. Um, and then, you know, our next session will be about building hope and repairing harm. So we're we're going to be continuing on that restorative lens and continuing with that trauma informed best those trauma informed best practices. Um, and really trying to center hope. It's so easy when we're talking about something so heavy to get bogged down in the deficit, to get bogged down in how hopeless things feel because sometimes they really do feel hopeless. Can I get an amen? Um, and so we're, right, we're gonna be talking about uh, together with you all how, how you all repair harm, right? How you all are building hope, hope and cultivating hope in your communities and your families and in your practice. And then in our in our final <laughs> yes in our final uh, community of practice, practice session we're going to be just really talking about intersection the intersectionality of the caregiver and the student experience right it's important when we're talking about this that you know as adults as professionals as parents as as caregivers we get so stuck in in our roles and what who we are and what our experience is that we that we unintentionally often uh, leave out kids, right? The very folks that we're here to to serve and sort of build up. So we're going to be talking about how we can how we can meet that that intersectionality of the caregiver and the student experience. What do what do the, what do caregivers need? What do students need, etc. Um, and at the end of July, we'll come back together for another couple of hours, like we're doing here today, and we'll look at what we've built. Um, we'll, we'll share out essentially, it's going to be one big share out. Um, and hopefully we will have done some, some amazing work that will help us, uh, to continue to build together so that we're not just stuck inside of this period of time, but we're actually moving forward together. I think, yes. All right. So, <laughs> so today, um, that was a whole lot, right? Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in, into the chat. Um, and yes, Mina and Jane can 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 look and can answer anything that that maybe I didn't cover or something seemed a little um, a little vague or not clarifying. Um, but today we're really going to focus on um, we're going to talk about trauma informed partnerships with schools and families serving youth with high needs. I know it's right there, but um, we're going we're going to talk about the importance of common language. And we're going to try to build a foundation of knowledge today. Um, and we'll also discuss healing-centered schooling, right? Um, and then we'll also talk about part, like those partnerships, right, with families, caregivers, and schools um, in the context of the pandemic. And we'll sort of explore a little bit today what the impact of the pandemic has been on families of youth with high needs. Um, and we'll we'll sort of talk about our views about what uh, reintegration into schools is going to look like. And then, you know, we'll, we'll do some next steps. What's next? And um, we'll do another overview of the communities of practice and, of course, try to answer any questions as we move forward. And I think I am about to kick it over to Laura. I did want to say just one last thing. If something's popping up today that we haven't if it, if it seems like we, we've grazed over it or we're not covering it in depth, um, let's, hold, let's, hold, let's hold some space. Let's definitely um, you know, you, use the chat uh, as, as sort of a parking lot or a garden, so to speak, a place where ideas can grow. Um, and let's also uh, be mindful that we're, we're going to be building together for six weeks. So as we're sort of blazing through things today, we definitely will be able to spend a little bit more intentional time with, with, with these topics and with each other. All right, Laura? Yeah, that was so perfect because I was going to say that. So that I'm so glad you did. Like that was so on my mind, right? Exactly. I, we want this to be a community. We want this to be interactive. I invite you to show uh, some radical acceptance. If something really resonates for you, I like to do jazz hands, right? You can use the um, reaction bar down here, um, you know, show a little love, use the party hat, but really uh, you use the chat, you know, like, amen. Like we really want you to um, come in and participate and react and ask questions. Um, thanks Jane for the thumbs up. Good job using the reaction bar. So yeah, let's get started. So we're gonna talk a little bit about language. 
um, and what that what that means to us um, and some of the things that we're going to like, like Melissa foreshadowed, don't worry, we're going to do these in depth during the COP. So if you're like, wait, that wasn't enough. That was only five minutes. There'll be more later. Um, all right, next slide, please. Okay. So we're basing this discussion in the six principles of trauma-informed care from SAMHSA. Um, so we wanted to make sure that everybody was grounded in what those are. What are we talking about? What do we mean when we say that? Um, and the six principles um, are safety. So safety, I would say safety first, right? Safety. How do we establish a sense of safety? How do we um, show and establish a, uh, an environment that has trust and transparency? And then how do we build um, an environment that encourages peer support? Think about that in terms of both youth and adults, right? How do we explore collaboration and mutuality in a real way? How do we collaborate with each other? How do we give space and uh, make sure that we are empowering people, that we're giving them voice, that we're giving them choice? And again, I'm always talking about young people and adults in the building when we're talking about this. And how do we always making sure that equity is at the center, that we are always having an awareness of the cultural, historical, and gender issues that are before us and around us um, in our curriculum, in our policies, in our practice, in our way of being, right? And all of these are, to me, are very interrelated. You, they're not siloed, right? In order to have trust, you have to have safety. In order to have safety, you have to have trust. In order to really support each other as peers, you need to trust each other. Um, and by empowering youth, empowering adults, um, giving kids voice, they learn to trust us and they make and they come to feel safe. So all of these are very important and very interrelated. So the prompt that we want you guys to first discuss, we want it to do as many um, breakouts as we felt like we could fit in today because we really want you to talk to each other too, right? Not just listen to us. Um, are these two questions, right? What do these principles feel like and look like when present? in school family partnerships. So really think about when you might have seen or felt, how does it feel in your body, right? What does it see like? What, what does it see like? What have you seen? What is it here? What have you heard? Um, what does it look like when these are present? And what do partnerships feel like, sound like, um, look like for schools and families when these kind of partnerships are not present? So those were our two prompts for the small groups. So our technological wizard, Joanne, will be magically dividing you up into breakout groups of four or five. Your breakout groups will be 10 minutes. And we're hoping that you come back with some insights to share. So one person who can share insights or be ready to populate them in the chat box. On your marks. Get set. Wizardry, Joanne. Welcome back all. 
What were some ahas that came up for you during your breakouts as people filter back in? Building relationships. Christine, was that in the context of what it looks like when partnerships are present? You're emphasizing that relationship? Yes. Um, yeah, I think that that is key in making good choices as we try to understand what folks are going through. If you don't have a relationship, it's hard to understand what that other person is going through. So I think that is the first thing and it's key. Mm. Lior wrote in the chat box that Ms. Penny and Ms. Beverly shared great examples, amazing examples of their loved ones, of their young ones advocating for their needs. Beverly, family voice and choice. Ooh, Amy, I like the simple interventions, just being greeted in the morning. How would we feel if we walked by a whole host of people that didn't acknowledge us as we walked in. And Betty uh, mentioned the need to embrace trauma-informed care principles, especially agencies and anyone who serves individuals living with disabilities. Yes, Betty, I agree. All right, I think I will pass this one back to Jane and Melissa to talk about why some of those principles of um, trauma-informed care are important and they start with the language we use with each other. Sorry, I was just wrapping up with uh, our group. We were, our group got rolling and then it was time to go. So I, I just wanted to check back in with <laughs> some folks. But yeah, so we were, you know, we've, like I said at the very beginning, we're really um, it invested in in really homing in on the on on a, a concrete type of language that we all use together, and so you know, as Laura introduced the tra trauma informed care principles, um, we also want to talk about trauma informed language and why it's important and what it is and. Um, and, and really just, it, it, a lot of it is so straightforward, right? It, it, this is always one of those places where I'm like, right, uh, I'm just saying what we all know, but sometimes we don't. Um, and you know why it's important, right? Language that's used to define our kids is often not, not the language that we would choose to, to use to, to describe them, right? Um, I, I, I know, for example, there's the, Everybody I know has a problem with the term um, emo severely emotionally disturbed to describe their own child. Um, it's not a term that any of us would use, but it's a, it's a term that we have to use in order to get particular services, right? So sort of delineating between those two things. Um, and you know, trauma-informed language really to, dovetails into that. It, it allows us to acknowledge um, kind of like who's harmed versus who's like who has benefited, like, or to look at who's, who's been harmed and who's benefited from, um, from language and labels um, that again, aren't created by us. And because also we're, we're at a really important inflection point in, in time, like we're able to choose, we're able to like have our own agency and choose what language we use to, to describe us, to define us, to identify us and our families and, and our kids. And most importantly, right, shared language, it's a really important, it's a vital way to bridge our partnership, right? That centers the kids that we work with. It centers the families that we work with as we're all sort of navigating the same systems. But when we're, when we're using that person first language, we're, we're, we're Im immediately starting to take stigma out of out of all of these things, we're not going, oh, I'm going into a meeting with another SED kid, right? Instead, we're saying, I'm going into a meeting with Laura and Laura's family, and we're all going to work together, right? I think we can move to the next slide. 
Laura, do you, do you feel like talking about this amazing bridge metaphor that we have built today? Sure. Yeah, we, we were thinking a lot about what, what was the most important thing we were trying to convey. And really this idea of a bridge kept coming up, right? That we are trying to bridge these partnerships between families and schools and caregivers and others in the system, you know, that surround our families. Um, when things have felt the best or worked well, it has felt like there is a bridge that we can, you know, we still may be a system of schools over here or the mental health system over here, or you know, we may be on our own pieces of land, our family unit over here, but there is a bridge that makes um, our connection possible and feel useful and supported. And so when we're talking about language, right? The language that we hear people use to describe our youth and families, right? Like obviously y'all can see some of these in the bubble, but maybe you can throw some in the chat. Tell us what, 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 what it, especially those of you who are caregivers or those of you who, um, who are working directly with students, with youth, like what, what do you hear? What, how do people describe your families, those kids? Mm challenging mm -hmm. mm. spoiled disruptive oh twice exceptional i like that oh. yeah aggressive oh boy oh that's a mm, activating word for me melissa and everyone's like Bing. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm family caring. yeah yeah heathen oh mm -mm. If they just put their mind to it, if they only made better choices. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That family isn't compliant. Oh, mm -hmm. the compliance piece, right? Yeah. Yep. So we just wanted to bring this up, you know, to both have this, you know, this is our experience of hearing this, right? My own kid, you know, he, when we did go have a, a trauma-informed IEP, and we can talk about that later, right? He looked at his diagnosis, his eligibility on the page and said, severely immersionally disturbed. And just looked at me and he's like, I'm not disturbed. Right. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, just ignore that. <laughs> mm. We're just going to have to ignore that for now and think about all the strengths. So then it's sort of the flip side of this, right, is our families are persistent and resilient and tenacious <laughs> um, and we're strong and our kids are sensitive um, and yeah. unique. What else, Melissa? I mean, creative, right? Mm. Creative is one of those first things that comes to mind whenever I think about my kid anyways, in any situation, um, whether or not uh, her behavior is desirable um, or not, I'm like, right, like this kid can think her way into and out of anything and she can create whole entire worlds um, that none of us are privy to. And just how, you know, I always think about like, wow, like what, what would it be like if we were at one of these IEP meetings and any one of these other professionals could, could say that? Like not in a, just a, like, let's just throw in an adjective to describe your kid real fast, but like could really see and acknowledge like, well, look at how amazing and creative this kid is all the time, right? How musical, how lyrical, um, how demanding in one of the best ways. Right. I always, as you know, my kid is, is at this time in place, a cisgender black girl. And I'm like, I want you to demand and take space in the world. I don't want you to ever be small or to ever feel like you're small. Um, but yeah, you know, well, so I, I, think, I think that really aligns with something um, Beverly said in the chat box. that's just really resonating with me um, when they talk about 
when she spoke about they can do better if they think outside the box and her reply is but is there struggle in a box mm -hmm. and i just am recalling some of our conversations um, as we prepared where people um, attempted to box in either physically or metaphorically someone's um, potential or capabilities right and I think, I think that really does speak to that next piece, right? Like what's, I think it might be on the next slide, like what, what are ways that language can really serve us and what are the ways that language really limits us? And I, I, think, I think that we've emphasized some of the ways that language can be limiting, but um, I would love to hear from other folks, like what are, what are some of the ways that language can really serve us and like in all the ways, in advocacy and support Ooh, okay, Christine just brought up, I think we need to also look at the nonverbal ways that children and families are dismissed. And I thank you so much for that. Um, because this is also, like when I'm talking about language, I'm not just talking about verbal language, mm. right? There are all of the ways, oh, like, I mean, eye rolling being, being number one, eye rolling and eyebrows, right? Um, because that's, that's emphasized in, in North American culture, but like, all of the ways in which we are, um, we, we can be so summarily dismissed. I walk into a room and your body language tells me everything I need to know about how you feel about me before, I e before you even open your mouth. Um, and, and simultaneously, like a way that that body language can really serve us is, you know, if we walk into a place with our he heads held high, right? Um, we walk into a place just exude whatever we're exuding, exuding confidence, exuding agency, um, that really can help folks look at us in a different way. Not that it's our job to make everybody else feel comfortable, but body language is sometimes so much louder than words. Melissa, can this is Chris? I, I, I put Christine, but I go by Chris. Um, I just also want to say the the number of expulsions and suspension is also where I was going with that is that that mm -hmm. speaks so loudly to like you're not wanted um, versus how can we really think about like that's not helping anyone when they're not engaged in school right if they're expelled how are they to learn what you want them to understand if you don't keep them and try to work together. Um, so I just wanted that piece to also be included. Thank you so much, Chris. That's so, it's, it's so real, right? I think one of the, one thing that's important to acknowledge in these times is um, why, how, how we got to a place where trauma-informed care became important in schools. Um, you know, unfortunately, it's not just because somebody had a bright idea one time. It's because, you know, they're across the country, the dis the disproportional number of black kids and indigenous kids and brown kids um, in special ed and then out of special ed, but in that order who are pushed out of classrooms put, and then pushed out of school um, is extraordinary, right? And so, yeah, that's, that's, that's very, very much connected. Yeah. Yeah, and in, in the chat, they brought up really great examples of both, you know, sometimes we need that label, right? I resisted getting him an IEP for so long, but then I had to, I had no other choice, but to find the labels that would get him the services that he needed until he, I mean, I waited all the way up until he was in middle school. Um, but they also, right, can then limit us. So, have, so we have to find that way, that kind of dance of like, okay, put it on the paper so I can get the services and then ignore it. Like then we have to just leave it there for now. That's another, a different battle, right? Then <laughs> how do we um, then use it to our advantage and not let it limit us and, and then use other ways of language to move us forward in a more supported way? Because I've seen too where, you know, in our in in our case, right, there's I'm an educator, I'm somewhat knowledgeable in 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 these realms. My my wife is an educator and very knowledgeable. Um, 
And so oftentimes <laughs> when we go into meetings, th- th- definitely we get, here comes that family, oh no. Um, <laughs> but, but we also get, when folks are really interested in partnering, um, like, thank you so much for teaching us too. Mm. Um, thank you so much for being here with us. Like, thank you for, for giving us different ways to, to talk about um, this kid. And so, you know, we've, we've established in some places, not all, unfortunately, but, you know, in the IEP, for example, IEP meetings where we, we legit will be like, okay, so we acknowledge that this is, this has to be here because it's on this piece of paper, but we'd like to talk about our kid in, in these terms. And that has actually really, really helped. It's, it's helped our, it, it has in the past helped our relationships with, with the people who are, you know, in charge of our kids' education and our kid getting those services. I just really want, I want to, I want to pause and highlight that really, that really excellent strategy that I don't think that had aha on me in our conversations before, but a really strong step that educators could take would be to see the label for what it is and then invite a family to um, define their own terms for, for how they will talk about um, the supports or the challenges or the in-betweens. And it's kind of like, here's what we have to do, but here's our wiggle room within it. Yeah. And maybe if we can look at the next slide, because I think the next slide has, is like a really good, uh, just, a, just a, a good visual for what we're talking about here, right? Like this idea of like all of, like all of the ways in which our kids are sometimes negatively labeled or we take on, uh, we sort of transpose a negative meaning onto, the, onto that label, how that can also, it can also mean something else, right? Like the idea of the inattentive kid who's just being distracted as opposed to being a dreamer right, um, who's just impatient as opposed to motivated, <laughs> really wanting to go out and get stuff done. Um, being, the idea of being hyperactive as, as negative as opposed to being like full of energy. Let me tell you at the age of almost 43, if I could be hyperactive, whoo, how amazing would that be? But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a reframe. so at this yeah go ahead yasmina no laura nope go for it all right if you insist um so right now we really want to give an opportunity for that different that kinetic learning so we really encourage you to take out a piece of paper and we're going to do five minutes of quiet reflection and journaling we'd like you to think about an integration of what we've talked about so far so you can write down one aha one lingering question that you have when hmm, um, and or or draw a little picture, something visual that represents your learning so far, and we will reconvene at whatever your local time is plus five minutes. For me, it will be two o three p.m. All right, everyone. We invite you to come back. Um, join us with your cameras on if you feel up to it, or at least. Bring your attention back to the screen. All right, so in the spirit of always having this be interactive, right? Um, we, as we, as we all kind of bring ourselves back to the space, we invite you to um, share with us in the chat or raise your hand and we'll, un, you know, you can unmute one or all of you know, your responses to these prompts. Did you have an aha? Do you, were you did a question pop up? Um, anything, anything. We, we wanna hear from you. I can go. I just, Great. oh, sorry, I'm video. <laughs> Hi, Amy. <laughs> Hi. I was just going to say um, that I'm grateful. And today was a long day, a very busy and stressful day, but it's, I just wrote about how it's good to hear that our others are continuing the dialogue about trauma, its effects. The more we talk about it, the better. So I, it's just nice that even though the 
part of me wanted to not get on from four to six tonight, my time. <laughs> I will say that I am feeling grateful. So thank you. Good. I'm glad. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, so I'll glad go. that you came, Amy. I'll go if you don't mind. Um, my, my whole moment was the fact that so you guys do listen to Family Voice of Choice because like all of most of the meetings that I've been in, even with my own daughter, it's always the paper's ready to be signed. <laughs> no. <laughs> There's no reason for us to stay here no longer than 15 minutes. The paper needs to just be signed. Um, so uh, understanding that you guys do listen to the family's voice and making sure that there are different choices for our kids and using those reframe words is something I always talk to my parents about because you know if if you're saying it at home if, you, if you're exhibiting those behaviors at home as a parent how are they exhibiting those be, you know behaviors at, at, at in the you know in the school you know reacting not just dealing with situations they're just reacting so mm. um i try to teach families how to use the reframe words so that their youth can teach people how to treat them and use words that are used at home to help them through a a struggle a process you know so it's important for families to understand that their voice does count they have different choices and they help their youth understand that their their voice matters as well Thank you that's for sharing a, that's that. a whole word. Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I just had to put in the chat, like how the papers are ready to be signed. Like, yes. Mm. Like how many times have you felt like that when you've walked in there? Um, yeah. Right. Just absolutely right on with that. And, um, you know, I appreciate what Jane said in the chat too, that our children it can be exhausting and challenging for all of us, right? This is not to Pollyanna over the realities in any way of what we are, you know, working with, right? We are here to be super real with you. Um, and it only, it's so much better if we can work together with this reframing in mind and just this approach, right? Because it's already hard. <laughs> It's already yes. really hard. It's hard at home. It's hard at school, right? Um, and it only can be made better with these really uh, excellent um, partnerships that we're, that we're hoping to engage upon. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Drop in the chat. Unmute yourself. Uh, this is Cynthia. And hi, Cynthia. I've, hi, I've long been an advocate. I come from P16 teaching and administration. I've long been an advocate for um, personal learning plans and all students would have one and it, is, it doesn't become punitive like an IEP mm. and you list, the, the child list helps list the strengths, uh, what needs the needs they have to be, or that we have to put in place for improvement because all kids need growth. And, and then everybody is on that personal learning plan, but it's, it's really for their growth. We really become student-centered when we do that. And with the IEPs, I've sat in many of them um, as a teacher and as a mother. And they're, they can be brutal and they're not always the most productive. Sometimes you have really good teams and it really is student-centered but oftentimes it's not. And then, or the child isn't even invited to come to it and they should have a voice um, in that decision-making too, or, or just be aware that it's about them and what about their needs and their concerns. And I know there is a time limit, you know, and only so many minutes in the day and they want to get it in and get it done. And then it's signed before they even come or someone doesn't show up who needs to be part of the meeting and then you have to reset up another meeting. It, we know it hasn't been effective really for students in the long term. Whereas if you have that learning plan, when they're ready for algebra, they're ready for algebra. You're not throwing them in and all of them are supposed to fit in that box. And I love uh, reading that in the chat box that um, you know, thinking outside the box. Well, why did we have them 
in a box to begin with. So I thank you for that. But I think that way, everybody, you're not treating those who struggle in certain realms, you're, you're isolating them out from the other kids. So why can't they all have a personal learning plan? That's and right. And we go forth with that and help each other out. Yeah. But I want to share too that I come from the arts. And so for me, that's what I lived with my classes. I had all diverse students in my classes. And whether they were in a special education group, hearing impaired, whatever, you know, we were all working in ceramics together. You had the, and I would team up tables where you had the athletes with uh, an autistic child and all of a sudden you would see where they were starting to help each other out because they were learning to collaborate with something that they hadn't known before and I've yeah. witnessed it in the arts and I just wish we could continue doing that instead instead of being punitive to kids who struggle because we all struggle in different ways. <laughs> Right. Well, that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. And I, yeah, I can't emphasize enough how much the arts have been a safe space for my kiddo for all the reasons that you mentioned. Um, all right. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you all for, for sharing. I mean, this is what we want, right? We want to give you a glimpse of, you know, these, these communities of practice that we're going to embark upon really are a community of practice, right? Us learning from you, you learning from us, us sharing with you, you sharing with us, and you learning from each other as well. Um, so we really, I know we're just getting to know each other, right? But we we really appreciate um, what you've contributed so far. So we didn't want to, you know, we do this, of course, without mentioning the current context with which within which we are existing, right? Because we were already you know, speaking from my own family experience, right? Things were already hard before COVID. That's Nessie. Thank yes. you, Betty. That is Nessie coming to, to disrupt our peace in the bridge, right? So we were like the Loch Ness monster comes along and that's COVID. We had to go with this water bridge metaphor, right? All the way through. Thank you for asking. Um, things were already really challenging before the pandemic and we had a ton of services in our house and he had a one-to-one -one at school and he was in a more restrictive classroom. You know, we had kind of already started moving up this, the scales of support. We had wraparound services at home and it still wasn't enough. We were still in total crisis. There was still, you know, all of the things. And then, <laughs> and then, um, school closed and services stopped completely, right? We had no services at our house. We had no services at school. It was just, all right, do you, like, I don't know, like everyone was freaking out. It took a while, like, and things, people started to come back to us, but all of these families were all of a sudden in the same context. I know I'm not alone, right? That we, we were challenged to feel safe at home but also school, of course, public spaces weren't safe. So there we were trying to balance this duality. And then we are all experiencing a collective trauma together. And that is a term I'm not dropping lightly. We are going to um, delve into that in the community of practice. What is collective trauma? How has that affected all of us? Partners, uh, families, educators, service providers, right? We are all experiencing our own trauma collectively in this pandemic and then trying to manage right what is going on at home and school um, so we wanted to kind of talk about some things that have been um, challenging but also some things that have worked if you can move to the next slide so i wanted to in the same way that we kind of tried to ground ourselves in the trauma-informed language we wanted to ground ourselves in the concept of a trauma-informed healing-centered school and this in by uh, these folks have just been described as a school where everyone that comes in the building feels valued, welcomed, and physically and emotionally safe, right? Safety first, and that remember those six principles of trauma-informed care. And I love the second part too, that the school has started to go through the process of removing structures that harm. We've already talked about some of this, right? 
expulsion, suspension, how we deal with discipline, how we talk, the language we use, the way we go about IEPs, that the school has already gone through the process of removing harm, structures that harm students, caregivers, and staff. Right. And they're starting to build. It's, a, it's always a process, right? They're starting to build structures that help students grow and creating a healing environment for everybody in that community. That's what we're working towards. And so I'm hoping to share some examples with you of what that has looked like for us as we've been able to experience that both before the pandemic and after. If you can go to the next slide. The regulation, again, this will be delved into more deeply within. Um, within our COP, but regulation and teaching schools, adults and kids about regulation is vital to being preventative and responsive as opposed to reactive and punitive, right? So understanding what it feels like in, in our bodies, our somatic experience, teaching kids, what does that feel like? Oh, my belly's getting tight, my hands are getting sweaty, my fists are balling up, right? What are the signals to them that their body is starting to dysregulate? And what can they start to do? What can we do? What, do we, what does that look like within ourselves, right? Adults have to regulate first. So that's often a big aha for teachers, like, oh, I haven't, I can actually completely dysregulate this kid even more. I can escalate this situation if I'm not regulated. So working with staff to learn their own physical response, their own triggers, their own signs of dysregulation, and then how to regulate themselves and then help a kid do the same. Understand what the signals are and what can we do to help everybody regulate. And then we can start relating, then we can start reasoning, then we can start furthering the conversation, but we can't get to any of that, that bottom up theory, right? We can't get to any of that until we're all regulated. So we just wanna emphasize the importance of that. Okay, next slide. Yeah, it's a great quote, right? A regulated nervous system means an increased ability to connect, collaborate, and creatively solve problems. And that's ultimately what we're often trying to do, right? Both as the parents and the kid and the teachers, like we need to solve some issues here and we can only really do that well if we can connect and build a good relationship. All right, so we're gonna go into some small groups, right? Prompt your thinking. We want you to think about what are examples of adults regulating so that the school family partnership can feel safe? So thinking about what do we do as adults? What have you seen people do? Um, what have you done yourself? How might youth with high needs benefit from trauma-informed and healing-centered schools. If we're talking about a school that is, you know, promotes healing and is safe and everyone feels valued and everyone feels heard and they're working towards, you know, repairing harm and building healing structures, how does that benefit, especially our kids, right? Everybody, but really our kids too. And in your experience, in whatever role that you come here, what's coming up for you in this part of the conversation of what we're hoping to get to. So who is the magic person that can put us into small groups? So when is Yay. our wizard? Hey everyone. I kind of got slingshotted back out of my room. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was like mid sure. sorry group. <laughs> we were having a really good discussion about regulation though. So it was you awesome. Were too. Yeah. There, some there has to be a has to be a slightly better way for Zoom to do this. <laughs> <laughs> like whiplash, right? Um <laughs> Yeah, I do love our small groups though. 
uh, yeah, we had some really great examples of, of adults um, practicing regulation to be preventative minded in my group anyway. Mm. Um, Lyric, as uh, her group talked about being at peace as language to use versus, or, or also with self-care, which oh. I really like because, you know, I have definitely felt like the self-care train has left the station and maybe run off the rails a little bit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> for sure. I love that. Yeah, at peace with language. I'm going to remember that. Um, oh, Chris, yeah. So that second question of how do kids benefit, how might high, you know, high need youth benefit from this kind of environment, right? Feeling safe and feeling calm. Absolutely. Yeah. Removing yourself from the meeting, step outside, take a drink of water, ask to oh. repeat, no surprises. Yeah. Betty, yeah. I haven't seen self-regulation from adults in an IEP meeting. Yes. Right, left. Can I love can I love that comment? Yeah. Me too. I high five that one. And you know, can I add a little something to that? Um, just on the <laughs> on the personal disclosure uh piece, right? Um, I'm coming at you as like as a parent, as also a professional, as a consultant. Um, and I have to say that I have been inside of CFTs, so ch child family team meetings um, and IEPs where as, you know, as, as the person who is, you know, at the end of the day, I go home with this kid. <laughs> I have, I've felt so incredibly disrespected um, and unseen. And I have definitely become that totally dysregulated adult in a meeting. Um, you know, obviously, obviously never like, you know, to, to a completely unacceptable standard, but, you know, to the extent where I'm like, okay, wait, none of us is on the same page anyways, right? And this is always the danger, the danger of, of, of not listening to our bodies and the danger of, of, of other people who are in charge in positions of authority, not listening um, and not paying attention. Like, when there are no rules, it seems like there's no rules. There's no actual set standard of expectation. Um, at, at a certain point, I'm just like, well, I'm going to start interrupting too. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to start speaking over you as well. Um, and it doesn't, it's not a matter of, of whether or not it's val valid or not. It's just like, this is what happens when we're not on the same page. When we are not partnered, um, we start clawing all over each other. And who's left behind? Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've had meetings with where my husband has been like, I'm not going to go to this meeting with you today mm -hmm. because it won't be productive <laughs> for anyone. <laughs> right. When we when we've been in more combative schools or more, I mean, that's maybe not the right word, but schools less willing to partner with us. Right. Yeah. He's felt the need to just not even go because yeah he would dysregulate quickly. <laughs> and there's that aspect of time. I know Beverly mentioned it um, when you popped in uh, where it's like, of course, like, yes, we all know, like, you know, there's only X amount of time for this, for this meeting or that meeting. Um, but I've always found it to be a little jarring when time starts running the meeting as opposed to like the needs are the important thing. Like I'm, I, I'm also the kind of person who's okay with saying we might need to schedule another meeting, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right? Like, like where the for when the format becomes the boss of the meeting, then, and then we go back into that the discussion around regulation. Um, when you are feeling in a hurry, like you have to hurry up and go, 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 go. Right. You're definitely not in a, in a blissful, peaceful, regulated state. Right. And if you're trying to get everybody else there at the same time, again, at the expense of everything else, like then, uh, then once again, we go off the rails. And once again, we have, you can feel the energy in a room shift yes. very quickly yes. um, and become, become very unproductive. And I mean, my partner has been all, yeah, I ain't, I ain't going to that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is sad, right? It's so, it's sad that, that the way they're structured, you know, that you can't even go yeah. 
right that it's just gonna yeah. anyway so yeah that's what we're trying to avoid we want everyone to feel like they can remain regulated during the meetings that they're productive and supportive and have uh have a good outcome yeah. um and we and again this again i'm just gonna repeat keep repeating this that we will go into what a trauma-informed iep meeting can look like as we delve into the cop we will give you lots of examples yeah all right next slide thank you everybody so right, I always feel there's this duality, and I, I expressed it before, it's been an experience of both bliss and grief. There is both things going on. It is hard to be at school, it is challenging to be at school, and it is challenging to be at home. The pandemic has really amplified um, the disconnect and duality and you know ripped the Band-Aid off so many things that we knew were challenging before. Um, and really uh, in some ways that's a silver lining, right? It's exposed, we can't look away, we can't pretend that it's working for so many people. Um, and yeah, this just really resonated. Okay, next slide. So <laughs> yeah, I love this meme because that's so how I felt, right? So as I, as I mentioned before that during when, you know, as schools close with no warning, there, for many, school was a respite. For us, it certainly was. When school was going well, school was a respite for all of us. He got a break from us. We got a break from him. Things were going well. We all got to kind of regroup um, for and recharge from our own dynamic. And the the you know when that stopped, when it was just okay, you're all at home together and you can't go anywhere and no one's coming to you. <laughs> right? There was no, all of our respite care folks were like, sorry, we're done for we don't know how long. It was isolating. And also the stigma of what we're going through, right? I mean, how I've gotten very comfortable at sharing our experience, but how many people are going to, how many parents are willing to share, like the police were at my house three times last week, or he was in the hospital twice in the last month, or I had to call the social workers, you know, mental health, crisis mental health team six times this month, all of the things that we're experiencing are isolating enough. And then all of a sudden to be completely shut in with each other um, and everyone else going through their own crises, personally and professionally, um, really changed the situation even, yeah. even more. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that more. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> And there's this feeling, you know, that's what they is called ambiguous loss. They call it that because it's not necessarily a recognition of an actual loss, like, you know, a, a traumatic incident or, you know, a death, right? Where we're like, okay, there's the specific loss that we're talking about. Closure and processing grief is more challenging when there's this ambiguous loss that we're experiencing of like, you know, of, of what we've all been going through over the last year. Okay, next slide. Whoops, one back one. Nope, other way. There we go, yay. All right, so saying that because I think it's really important to understand that as we enter, all of a sudden schools are really opening up, you know, over the last few weeks, as children and adults, all the school staff, right, as we're coming back into the building, we're bringing all this with us. All of our experiences of the last year that we've been experiencing in, not with each other, but in our own um, families and communities, varying amounts of grief and loss and also joy, right? All of these things are coming. And it's really, really important for schools and organizations and, you know, anyone serving youth, right? As we come back together to acknowledge and process this together, to go slow, to slow down, to allow for space for that collective experience. And I'd give kids all, you know, through the arts, through writing, through journaling, through talking, like how, what was your experience? Did you, you know, they lost people. If we attempt to skip over this part, all the adults are gonna be dysregulated. And we already talked about the dangers in that, right? A bunch of dysregulated adults running around with their unprocessed grief. It's gonna spill out. It's gonna come out of, of all of the, all of the ways that it does, right? And the youth are going to be in all their good maladaptive behaviors acting out their grief. And that combination right there 
is a recipe for a big old mess. And that's what we're hoping, hoping, hoping to prevent as much as we can with this conversation. Um, all right, next slide. Laura, there, there yes. was something about that, that when you combined it with the grief and the bliss, it really, it really demonstrated to me sometimes as adults, we expect dysregulation to present a certain way. Mm. Really like the idea that it may be bliss and joy that bliss and grief, the, the both and, um, because there will be some celebration as we return. And that can, that can be part of, I don't, I want to say like grief, but like embracing the new normal. And so yes. it can be dysregulating to be blissful and grieving. That's such a great way to put that in concrete terms. Yes, I mean, I really appreciate that because it's exactly right. Some people are so excited to be back in school and they've got all this right. So they have to be able to, we have to process that and regulate each other and regulate ourselves. And we're all managing the best we can, right? We're just super overwhelmed. Everybody, so much grace, so much grace for everybody, our kids, ourselves, the teachers, um, the service providers. Okay, next so vicarious resilience is kind of, as we're looking towards what props us up, right? And compassion resilience, the ability to maintain our physical, emotional, and mental well-being while responding compassionately to people who are suffering, right? So I love this idea, like this is, we talk about compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, you know, those are so real, but what does it mean to, what are we working towards? What does it mean to really feel this, um, be able to feel compassion. So I love this term of like compassion resilience. This is what we're hoping um, to cultivate in a, in a healing centered environment, right? That people can respond this way. And there's a great resource on the slide that we wanted to put in there that is a compassion resilience toolkit for parents and caregivers. And it's got a lot of really great stuff in there. Thanks for putting it in the chat, Ismina. All right, next slide. So one, one way that is mentioned to figure out ways in a, in a building, age appropriate, right, that we can witness because as Peter Levine says, trauma is not what necessarily what happens to us, but what we hold inside in the absence of empathetic with witnessing. So if that's true, if we want to help release this trauma, what does empathetic witnessing look like for kindergartners? What does empathetic witnessing look like for 12th graders, right? For the adults, if you need to get all your adults together. Um, and do this first with them. Yes, Mina. Did you have your hand raised? I did. Okay. I did. I'm really resonating on, on something you just said a slide ago. If you could um, just pop back really quick. Um, and I'm wondering if I can hear from your perspectives as parents, like about a time someone showed you um, compassion or a time that you experience compassionate resilience, having listened to some of your stories, just a time when it worked. I can share. <laughs> oh, Beverly's coming. <laughs> um, so my daughter was in 12th grade, um, getting ready to graduate high school. The principal of the school came to her meeting. Um, him showing his, the, his, him showing compassion as far as, and empathy as far as um, making sure she got what she needed, not what they wanted, wanted, the teachers wanted her to have to graduate. He said, no, she needs to take this class in order for her to get her credits. No, she needs to take this class in order for her to graduate, in order for her to get, to get, out, of this, to get out of school so she can go on to college. You know, so he kind of implanted himself on the meeting, <laughs> in the meeting and, um, and, he said, if you don't mind me, I suggest some things. And it didn't dawn on me that, okay, like I said, in the meeting, they tell you, okay, the papers are signed, they're ready to go. Um, he said, no, she needs this, this, and this. Um, if you agree, I'm going to show you exactly what she needs and why she needs this. So he showed me exactly what she, what she needed and why she needed it. And she was able to walk that field. So that was a time when uh, compassion and empathy was shown within the school and had to wait till we got to the 12th grade. <laughs> but, you know, I guess it comes with whomever is in, you know, a part of the, the meeting. 
that just wants to make sure that this child gets what they need. Not all, not all teachers are the same. Not all professionals are the same. You know, sometimes that there's just a book that they have to go by. And as a parent, you know, if we need to help them get along the way and teach them, teaching our kids, we can do, we have to learn to how to do that. That's what I had to learn how to do. He taught me something that day, show me what I need to do to help my child get along and be a successful in society. That's awesome. I love that, that person. Thank you to that principal. Yes. And thank you for sharing that. I seen him I out have, in the store one day and I say, I, I don't know if I ever got to thank you, but I really, really appreciate you. Aww. So critical. <laughs> You know, not in a school setting, but um, my my kid was uh, sent to, um, I'm trying to frame it delicately. Uh, she had to go hang out in an institution for a few days and chill out. And she had been there several times over the course of the year, about nine times. And uh, at, out of the woodwork popped this clinical director. And, you know, whenever they bring out the clinical director to our meetings, we're like, oh no. <laughs> we're in trouble right um this person was so was so gracious with us and really met us where we were in our you know with our knowledge and also was able to was able to again we were partnering now so we were able to like hear hear suggestions hear thoughts um this person became a resource for us for years afterward um and was was always like hey reach out to me for this connected us with a great family therapist, like just was, was really willing to do work that was not in her job description, right? It wasn't in her nine to five. And I mean, to this day, mention of her in our house is like, oh, <laughs> she's incredible. I think everyone demonstrated, even Jane in the chat box, the sometimes we just need to hear someone else just outside of ourselves acknowledge even information we know in our heart but to just say it out loud I think really goes to the net the point you're making on your next slide I think um what everyone has shown is that the compassion the empathy it was through that it was through that witnessing uh Melissa I heard you say like meeting us exactly where we were at uh, Beverly, I heard you say that that person, um, that principal took time that he didn't have to and, and went way around to feel seen. Um, Jane, the therapist saw, you know, something that you were carrying and just named it and just witnessed it. And um, sometimes as an educator, when we feel powerless, realizing that to notice someone is one of our most um, powerful skills. And it doesn't, it doesn't take much to do. Yeah, awesome. All right, move on to the next slide, please. All right, so bridging our learning today, what does this all mean? And I'll, uh, now that we're, I, I saved my, my response to your question, Yasmina, because this is where I'm gonna share, right? That when we, when we have this working well, what does that actually look like? for us, and, and Melissa got to a little bit of it right there when she said that the, that interaction with that person, they were more willing to listen because we were in true partnership. We were willing, you know, we could hear and they could hear, right? There was just that opening that often we're so closed. Um, our armor is very thick from these experiences. And so after having some really intense negative experiences in a, in a school system over about four years where my kiddo was suspended, you know, weekly <laughs> almost. And my husband was there every day at school in the principal's office. My kid was under desks and throwing things and walking out and getting in fights, right? This was his, and he, this was a kid who loved school in elementary school, like would cry if he was sick you know, his first experiences through fourth grade, he loved school, even though he cried all the time and was, you know, super like sensitive and was that just that, you know, super sensitive kid, couldn't wear itchy tags, all of the things, right? Middle school though, for I'd say fifth grade through seventh grade, 
was so traumatic. You just saw like his soul get crushed by the system. And as someone who loves him and loves school, it was really, you know, I love schools. That's why I work with schools. It's my passion, right? It was so hard to watch that shrinking, you know, he felt his self-esteem, his self-worth, his sense, he knew he couldn't control so many things. And so anyway, that's, we moved him from that into another public school district near us about half an hour away that is built on the complete opposite principle, right? This is a trauma-informed school. And before the pandemic, they actively cultivated safety, trust, collaboration, authentic partnerships, and a sense of belonging for us as parents, right? Always welcoming, always inclusive, always strength-based, always person first. And slowly our armor started to dissolve a little because we came in all armored up. I don't trust you. You've hurt me. You've hurt my kid. It's a, even though I'm choosing to move you to, to this school, I still don't trust you. I think I, I think I might trust you, but I don't trust you yet. And so they worked very hard. My husband felt comfortable going to all the meetings, right? If that tells you anything, right? Like his armor was down. And eventually we opened up this dialogue so that when my son was hospitalized for 72 hours, when the police had been to our house, when social workers were called, they knew everything. I called them right away or sent them an email. So they completely knew what was coming back into the building. I was like, just a heads up. This is what his weekend was like. You know, I want you to know what kind of headspace he's coming into. And so they were never surprised. So they loved this back and forth. They were like, what else can we do? We're going to partner with this university and get some more therapists in here. And we want to set him up with one. Like they were constantly thinking about how to support him. What does he need? Right. And his IEPs were completely the opposite of, of, of these, you know, bad experiences where we walk in and they were just like, all right, what are his strengths? What do, what do we want to do to support him? You know, always coming at it from this very warm, inclusive, he was there, you know, Xander, what do you need? You know, what do you want for your day to look like? How do you get along with your teachers? What do you need your teachers to do? And so it was a completely 180 experience, right? So then when the pandemic hit, we felt supported already. And so that trust and safetyness, that sa sense of safety, that trust, that collaboration was already there. And it made things so much easier, even though things were really, really hard. All right, next slide. And so for him, I wanna talk about when we change our school environments and this, we're gonna spend a whole session talking about this. So if you have a punitive environment like he was in before, the result was the fact that he was always, they were rigid and he was explosive. They were deficit-based and he felt horrible about himself. He was, you know, and, when you go into a space where they know regulation, they understand regulation. And so when he starts to dysregulate, the adult in the room takes a deep breath and they go, okay, what do you need right now? Do you need to go take a walk? Do you need to shuffle some cards? Do you wanna go get a drink of water? Do you need a buddy? Like, do you need to go see your favorite adult in the building? He had all these choices about how to regulate himself that moment. There wasn't the artificial boundaries of like, you can't leave the classroom right now because I have the power and you can't move past that door or you, you know, anytime he was in class, he could get up and like move around as long as it wasn't disruptive, right? They kind of set some boundaries for him, but he, they understood. And it wasn't, the thing is, is that this was a universal approach. And this is what I want to emphasize is that the school was like this for everybody. When you have a trauma-informed, healing-centered school that uses this approach universally, it prevents 90% of the problems. And so even with him, even with a kiddo who has really real mental health needs, real dysregulation issues that he can't control, right? Those approaches, he, he was a suspended once in ninth grade, once after like 20 the year before because they were preventative, because they were responsive, because they regulated themselves, because they had this approach. And when things went sideways, because they do, right? He still had issues that caused him, he did get suspended. It was an in-school suspension. 
And when we showed up at school, the first thing the principal said was, how can we support you? I think we've got him regulated for the moment. I gave him a hug, you know, like they were, I was like, I'm going to hug you, right? Like it was just a totally different way that we had ever been treated before and the way to completely different response. And then when he came back from his suspension, there was a recognition that harm had been done. So it was restorative. And how do we welcome you back? And how do we all love you? And so he, he didn't walk in feeling like I'm this horrible person who did this horrible thing and no one will ever forgive me. And everybody hates me, right? It was all of his peers and his teachers had a restorative approach when things went sideways. And so that made a hundred percent of the difference. And I think we can move towards that for all schools. I mean, that is my goal, right? Is that I see how this benefits every human in the building, the adults too. The teachers are happy there, <laughs> right? Happy teachers, happy parents, happy kids. Even when things aren't perfect, there's all sorts of, I mean, my son is in a residential school right now because it still wasn't enough, even with all of that support. But it made a huge, huge difference over the last three years you know, in that part. And, he, and, and they're still his home school. So we still partner with them, right? They're still supporting us and him, even though he's not physically there. So I just want to, um, that's what gives me hope. Is that yeah. seeing that there are spaces like this, that it didn't cost them a lot of money to be that way. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. those are, those are time, many times when we've been shown that kind of compassionate approach. I mean, the compassion is critical, right? And yeah. it doesn't cost that much. Like, as, as you were saying, like, I mean, dollars and cents aside, it doesn't, it actually, it doesn't diminish anybody to treat other folks with respect. It doesn't diminish you or me to, to pause my, my, my practice, pause my, you know, nine to five thinking to come at you and say, hello, how can I support you? I see you. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah. One thing um, that resonated with me recently is um, someone wrote that in, in secondary school and high school settings, this for the majority of our students, particularly if they're students, um, who have some type of identified disability, this may be their very last time that they have the opportunity to participate in education. This may be the very last time in their life that they are invited into a classroom for free <laughs> and that they get to have that experience and, and, and what an honor it is to show up for, the, for our students to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, I mean, not to, you know, I know I recognize that we need to keep it pushing, but I did just I want I want to keep on saying this as a, as a check for me and a check for for everybody else that um, that there is there it, it is entirely possible to do this and to do this well and to do this with to do this with love and compassion and that and what that means is that you know Laura was talking about um, going like just even going to this new place being like all oh, you know bowed up full of armor like nah. Mm -mm. Um, <laughs> Uh, that 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 can also be rescinded in time. That we can we 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 can actually move and be moved to a place of of collaboration and cooperation. And I know that that's that's always been a goal for me um, in my in my kids' own care and and in with the hundreds of kids that I've worked with that are like my own kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, that keeps me going, right? Mm. One thing that we um, had all kind of realized as we were talking and planning this is that we've experienced this, we called it an empathy window, right? That I've been talking about this kind of transition in schools for most of my life, <laughs> I think. And I feel like I've been screaming into the wind and slowly gaining traction over the last few years. But with the pandemic, for me, the silver lining is that with the collective experience of trauma, people are like, oh, oh, okay. 
this is what you've been <laughs> kind of going on about. Um, yeah. So what about you, Melissa? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, I laugh because it, it's a coping mechanism at this point. It keeps me from yeah. crying. Um, the, the part where folks are like, oh, is that what you meant? <laughs> right. After the, um, you know, again, I, ca I can't speak to your experience, but I have a feeling that you and Jane and probably a hundred other people here have experienced this one. Have you tried this? Mm. The, the have you tried syndrome mm. um, where, where you're like, I, I actually, I, 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 don't, I don't feel like there's enough time and space in the world to tell you all the things that I have tried um, with consistency and with fidelity. <laughs> because I also love research and I'm a big fan of these processes. I'm like, yes. Um, and yeah, so like, but like being able to, sorry, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a real quick, quick thing. Um, even though we're running out of time, we had this, we've had this encounter with a particular social worker that is not great. Um, we have, my partner and I have talked with our close friends about our close support systems about this particular person and, um, and without going into great, great detail, uh, this person had to come to our house. The social worker had to come to our house. I wasn't able to be present with my partner while she dealt with this person. And so I called a friend, um, who came and basically was able to bear witness to how the social worker had been treating my partner and I, and it was, you know, at, over the course of six years, it was the first time that he had actually seen this happen. And he was so shook by it, he had to go home and journal about it. Um, he had to talk, like he wanted to process it with me, you know, he had, and I, I just for weeks afterward felt this wave after wave after wave of like, I have been telling you it's, it's like this. I have been expressing this to you and then feeling really grateful that he was able to experience that. And we, we had had that happen a number of times when we, you know, kind of grabbed, grabbed our community and wrapped them around us in the absence of other professionals who could help us, right? When people could see what was happening and they were like, oh, oh, oh my goodness. And now, and, and now that like that question, how can I help you actually, it, ha it, it has a little bit more meaning to it. And there, rather than them just being sympathetic and like, oh, it sucks. I'm so sorry for is there anything I could do, you know, running halfway out the door. They're really needing that, that empathy piece is actually is, it's an action point, right? Empathy is action and, and, and being, being moved again, moved into action uh, with and to, to, uh, together at the same time has been at times really overwhelming, honestly. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we are all going through this in real time, right? We are doing this still, even with you now, right? We are, we are, this is not in the yeah. past for any of us. Right. So we are all, we you know, we were at appointments yesterday and meetings today. And, you know, we're all feeling all the feels while we're sharing these experiences with you. And we, and that's why we want to do it is because I think we all still have a lot of hope in answering that last question there, right? That how do we seize this moment and our personal experiences, both, you know, of triumph and of tragedy um, to leverage lasting change for all of our students in these environments. That's what I want to do with you over the next many weeks that we are together, yeah. right? So there was, your, there was your teaser. Hey. hey, I'm looking forward to the community of practice, y'all. Let's go. Yeah, but I know we're trying to get into it now. Um, <laughs> Joanne, I'm going to say that we will not have time for our um, next activity because I would like to highlight one more time that this is just the beginning of our journey and uh, we did have to rush through some of these topics but we plan to unpack all of them with care hopefully with you as our partners and in the chat box I popped our survey link to let us know what about this conversation was valuable ways we can improve um, as we invite you into our space to, to join, to build the next part of this institute that will happen on the 20th, your voices will be important if you want to go to the next one. So survey, next. Okay, so a little bit, you're like, this is great. Who are you one more time? 
can I come to more of your trainings for free? Yes. Why, yes, you can. Um, we are the National Training and Technical Assistance Center, and we serve the mental health and education workforce or anyone who's creating a community of care for students or families with, with needs anywhere along the continuum of wellness, but especially mental health challenges. Click. And we will serve anyone who works with children, um, but particularly that workforce, those folks who are making policies, practices, procedures that impact our kids and keeping our youth at the table. Click. And these are all the things that we do. They're wonderful and magnificent. And now I have met my, made all the funders happy showing you some of the beautiful things that we have coming up, the other part of this Leadership Institute. We're also, if any of you are project aware states or um, state leaders in education or mental health, we're hosting a policy institute to help move the needle at a systems level of change. And one more upcoming event. We also are partners with School Crisis Recovery and Renewal and the one and the only Leora is here. But I see we're at time, so I don't want to hold everyone past three o'clock, but no, and please go to their website, because if you are an educator, what they have to offer is critical as we recover and renew from the ongoing and intersecting difficulties that we have faced in the last year. Thank you, everyone. It's been Thank you, everyone. an honor and a blessing and a privilege to hold this space with you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope to see, you, to see soon. you soon. Yeah. Thanks. Join us. Applause, applause. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Betty. Thank you, Betty. We appreciate you all. Thank you, Brent. That was so nice. <laughs>